You're listening to This Week in Property. Stay current, relevant and up to date in the world of property investment. Learn from the UK's leading property professionals and grow your property business. Hello and welcome to This Week in Property. I'm your host Richard Swan and in today's show I had the pleasure of sitting down with not one but two guests today. We've had Neil Monroe and Ian Stone from Acorn Analytical Services. And both of these gentlemen are here to help you today. And they're here to help you with probably one of the scariest words that you can ever hear when you're involved in the world of property. It begins with the letter A, I'll tell you that. And whether you're a landlord, a tenant, a buyer, a seller, a sourcer, portfolio builder, property manager, whether it's residential, commercial, doesn't matter what. If you hear this word, this word, sorry, it will strike terror in your heart. A shiver will go up and down your spine. <laughs> but I don't want you to worry because these guys, these guys are the experts in this field and they've got so much knowledge, so much experience uh, that they're able to help you with that. It was a fascinating conversation. I personally learned so much about it today, and I know that you are going to do the same. So I'm still not telling you the word. (laughs) Keep clued in, keep listening in, and without any further ado, Mr. Neil Monroe, Mr. Ian Stone from Acorn Analytical Services. So, Neil, Ian, good morning and welcome to This Week in Property. How are you both? Good, thanks. Yeah, all good. All good, thank you. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to this chat, and it's one of those scary chats. <laughs> it is indeed. It's one of those things that if you put it on the table, it can sometimes scare a lot of people off from getting involved in property, from even thinking about property investment. You know, it's this big scary A word that hangs over our heads. But uh, as I mentioned this in the intro, I'm going to, I'm going to keep the listeners waiting along uh, before we can get into that. I love, I love teasing them. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so before we have that chat, uh, and it's a chat that's, you're, you're, you're here to help a lot of people when we get into that subject. So it's, it's yeah. a brilliant thing that you're doing for our, for our listeners. I really appreciate it. But Let's get to know yourselves a wee bit better. If I come to yourself first, Neil. Yep. If I asked you, you know, how did you get to this stage? What, what's your kind of career? What's the background? What's the, the little twists in the, the journey of life that have brought you to this? How would you answer me? How would you come back with that? Um, well, am I allowed to say the word yet? <laughs> 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 no, let's get on the table. It's the big scary word that is bestest. Yes. And it's one of those, if we see it written down, if we see it on a report, if someone talks about it, if we get a chat in the door for a property manager, it's like, oh my God, it feels like yeah. the end of the world. It feels yeah. like just mission impossible. Uh, it's, 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 it's like one of those, it's as emotive as like politics and religion and then you've got asbestos as well. <laughs> that, that's the order. <laughs> I love it. So all we need now is Donald Trump to say that the big wall in Mexico is going to be made out of his business. And that's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all bets are off. <laughs> no, no, we won't, we'll get into the, the asbestos and how to handle things and stuff. So yeah. that world, I mean, how do you even approach that? Were you sitting in high school, Neil, and the guy said, yeah, you need, you need to go on a career in asbestos? No, definitely not. No, I think anyone, no, no one uh, within the industry ever sort of puts on their on their careers advisor at school to say that's the thing I want to get in. I think everyone pretty much who I've ever spoken to kind of fall into the industry. Um, so to give you a bit of a background on myself, um, I I was working um, before the, coming into the industry probably about 17, 18 years ago. I was working, did various jobs, came from a bit of a catering background. Um, I did a, uh, a bit of work in banking as well before that, nine to five, um, and it bored me really. So I was looking for something um, a bit different. I saw an advert for a trainee role, so I literally came in right at the mm-hmm. bottom, um, having pretty much zero knowledge about asbestos, and didn't even really know what it was. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, and literally just started right from the bottom as a trainee role, um, and I trained as an asbestos surveyor, um, and at the time, um, I also trained in all the disciplines within the industry, so um, it was surveying buildings for asbestos, um, doing air monitoring, 
um, overseeing sort of removal works and doing clearances of those works and also in, in the lab as well analyzing samples so kind of like did a real sort of base um done every role, role. Haven't you? yeah yeah so trained up um and sort of progressed through the company that i was with mm -hmm. got up to a senior level of um sort of contracts manager um managing projects and looking after and helping clients and um, mm -hmm. their asbestos needs uh, and then kind of like develop that and and now I'm, I'm a director of acorn um within and we've got a few of our business partners as well um and yeah we, we sort of specialize in removing asbestos headaches from from our clients Brilliant stuff, good man. And Ian, for yourself, I, I want to hear about this man's uh, mad scientist approach in the lab with samples and stuff. But <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you are you the same character with the, the white coat? And that was you straight from high school, straight into it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I've always wanted to be an asbestos consultant. <laughs> I'm lying. Just, um, just like every boyhood. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> every boyhood dream. It's funny, I was talking to my little boy. He's uh, he's just turned seven. And I was right. talking last night about... Um, he, he kind of started the conversation. Because every now and now and again, we talk about what um, what, he, what he wants to do. Yeah. And recently, he's been saying he wants to do asbestos, but in the environment. So saving animals and stuff from it. I'm like, no, you, you, don't, don't. Do, do something different, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, and myself, I mean, it's kind of, I've got a very similar background uh, to Neil. I, I, I fell into it. I, uh, when I left school, I worked all sorts of jobs, worked in construction for a while. Um, directly before I kind of came into the asbestos industry, I, I was working at a solicitor's. Mm -hmm. Very similar story. I, I was just bored. Bored of the mundane, bored of the nine to five, bored of my desk job. Um, saw an advert for um, a, a trainee role. And went for it, and uh, well, <laughs> I went for it once, and oh. then the day, the day before I was due to um, go for my interview, I had a massive motorbike accident, oh. put myself in hospital for six weeks, um, really oh. did ruin myself. Like I've got pins and all sorts in my arm, and uh, oh my goodness, uh, yeah. And then it's so about a year later, it was kind of a fate thing. I think I was destined to uh, be an asbestos a little bit. <laughs> A year later, I was back at work at the solicitors and um, looking through the paper, and the, exactly the same job advert was there. Um, wow. Yeah, so I contacted them and said, oh, I don't know if you remember me, but I couldn't come to the last interview because I nearly killed myself. Um, <laughs> Which is a great excuse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. You get a good excuse. Happen, yeah. <laughs> um, but they said, yeah, no, we remember you. And uh, I went along. Um, had the interview during my interview went into the lab looked at some samples yeah. um, really kind of discussed it I thought you know what this is for me um, really? yeah it grabbed you it, it did because yeah. all the elements about it was that there was the scientific background in it that I, I enjoy um, mm. and the, the getting out and about and seeing different places seeing different buildings yeah, of course as well as a little bit of office time and I was like Do you know what that sounds pretty good so that's kind of how I fell into the industry and then as my career progressed um again same as neil i've done all the all the job roles the analytical on site the analytical in the lab i've been a surveyor um i've worked on the removal contractor side or the dark side as uh, as we call it <laughs> um for my sins i did that for a little while um and also i kind of left day-to-day -day practice for about three years as well um yeah. because it's kind of an ongoing theme with me i'll do something for quite a while and then i'll get bored Right. Um, so I left practice and I went and ran the uh, trade association for three years for the asbestos testing and consultancy side of our industry. Yeah. Uh, and while I was there, I put together some new industry qualifications and stuff, um, got them up and running, brought a bit of competition in the marketplace for the quals. Um, and then I kind of got bored again. <laughs> and then yeah, there's there's a pattern here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I got bored and then that was kind of six years ago and, that's when Neil and I uh, started the Acorn Northampton office. Brilliant stuff. So in a Neil, nutshell. <laughs> yeah, in a nutshell. <laughs> Neil, I don't know if you've got your advert just ready because I'm worried that this man's going to get bored again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> the clock is ticking. Seven uh, year itch. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, brilliant, right, that's great, so we've got a wee background, get a wee feel for the, the people we've got on the show today, that's excellent, so let's now get into the, the meat of it, let's get into the weeds of it, and do you know something Neil, you touched upon it yourself, you said 
I didn't even know what asbestos was at that yeah. time. There's a perfect place to start because you just the mention of that word and there's a shiver up everybody's spine, whether, you know, landlord, tenant, property manager, HMOs, service, you name it, anywhere at all in the world of property. Uh, we think of the beautiful bricks and mortar picture, everything's lovely, tenement houses, you name it. But if that word comes up, oh my goodness, everybody wants yeah. to run for the hills. Uh, yeah. What is it? Tell me it's not kryptonite. Tell me it's something else. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not a lot. Of, there is a bit of a misconception about what asbestos is. Um, yeah. Some people think it's man-made. Um, some people think it's spores, etc. That sort of grow in your house, um, but it, but it's not that. So right. asbestos is um, it's a naturally occurring silicate mineral. So it's uh, it's right. basically a mineral out of the ground. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Um, and that sort of naturally occurs in many parts of the world. And sort of the, the main places where it has come from um, are Canada, um, South Africa, Russia is a big producer now. Um, yeah. Sort of species come from Australia. So those pockets around the world. Um, it is naturally occurring in, in the UK. However, it, it's never been on the scale that it's ever been sort of mined or commercially used. So right. um, it, yeah. So all the asbestos that has been put into buildings within this this country uh -huh. has come other places within the world so um, at one point the UK was the biggest importer of asbestos so wow. um, we've used tons of the stuff right and asbestos raw fiber um, is then added to secondary materials um, and there's it's estimated sort of around 5,000 different products have been created using asbestos. really so, that many yeah, yeah that, you know, um, goodness that's the surveyors we're in the industry we're still seeing stuff uh, that we've never seen before. Yeah, yeah. Our, our guys bring stuff back monthly. <laughs> at least once a month, twice a month, there's something that you come back and go, wait until I show you this photo. And they show the photo and it's like, I found that today it. and we've never seen it. Yeah. Oh my um, goodness. Yeah, it's madness. Yeah, it, it was kind of, there was a rule of thumb. Um, when, when a specialist was used at its height, um, the industry thought, if, if there was a product that we could make better mm. or cheaper by adding asbestos to it, then that's what, that's what happened. That's what they did. Wow, that's crazy. Just yeah. some crazy stuff. I mean, um, we, we, we teach uh, asbestos awareness um, courses and mm -hmm. we've got some weird and wonderful things in there. And I mean, some of the, some of the things that come to mind of uh, dishcloths it was in. Um, it was sold in dishcloths in America. There were um, kind of booties that you could wear and line your boots with. Um, just some really random yeah, ones. Yeah, fire suits, um, you know. Wow. <laughs> We weren't just building with asbestos, we were wearing it, we were using it in everyday life. So, some of the old films, they used it, uh, asbestos snow. Yeah. Oh, it, really? It, it, <laughs> it, yeah, so, just for effect? Yeah, wow. It, uh, Wizard of Oz and uh, I think it's Bing Crosby's White Christmas. Uh, there's like scenes and it's just snowing down and... Oof, raining uh, down asbestos. Asbestos that was used, yeah. That's incredible. Now, Ian, I mean, based on what Neil's telling me there, you know, it's this natural, you know, element, substance, whatever, it comes out of the ground, it's all around the world in different elements. So the, the two things that kind of pop up for me straight away there is, number one, well, that must mean it's completely fine because it's natural. So what, what we're worried about. And then number two is, what is it about the substance that led us to throw it into absolutely everything, you know, these 5,000 products? What is it, what characteristics is it about it? Or put it in there or add it in such and such? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the, the main characteristics are sort of um, fire retardancy, chemical resistance, uh, good, it's kind of good at adding strength to other products as well. Really? Right, okay. Yeah, I mean, in ancient times, we know in ancient times uh, in Greece and stuff, they were using it in clay pots and things to reinforce uh, the clay pots that they were using to cook with. Ah. So it's it not kind of a new thing. Um, and some of the old philosophers were writing about the fact that uh, their slaves were dying from using this raw material and using it within their products. Right. So it's kind of, yeah, we've known about it quite a while. Um, wow, yeah, that's that's the first day uh, Acorn office back in Athens. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. I might win that now, that'd be quite nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, okay, so that then makes sense. It's got these properties, it's got these characteristics, yeah, and, and, and you can see that it leads on to things. Sorry, yeah, you were going to say that. Yeah, there's kind of, there's nothing that's ever been um, found or created that could do the job as good as asbestos. No. Um, and that's so heavily used, and, and that, 
so you've got a, a product which is does all these magical things and it was marketed as the magic mineral right. you know, it was so good at what it did and at the end of the day it was a source which they could dig out of the ground sure which they use yeah. So it's kind of an abundancy um, the, uh, as the, the industrial revolution sort of geared and the mining techniques were, were, were better, you know, we could get all this stuff, you know, in abundance. Uh, and it was so good at what it did. And mm. everyone, you know, was, was trying to come up with a new way of using this material um, just because of that. Because it's there and because we could it use so it. Good. And it was cheap. And <laughs> yeah, cheap. exactly. It's ready yeah. available. Okay. You know, it's funny. It, it reminds me of something I've been reading recently about the, the fabric. I think it's called a fabric hemp, uh, yeah. you know, grown just everywhere. But it's so flexible, so strong, so light, so natural that at one point they were trying to use it everywhere. I think even the first Model T card, you know, from Ford, uh, right. car, sorry, they, they were made making the panels in hemp. Really? Wow. And they, yeah, it's quite fascinating. And then through a whole host of political uh, manoeuvres and people trying to uh, consolidate the industry, and mm. it was just, you know, it was kind of cast to the side and it was kind of uh, poo-pooed upon and they started using other fabrics. It seems very similar to that. You know, it, the, does. it does. It does. In, in yeah, in the flip of that, like the industry got behind it yeah. and uh, propaganda uh, around it. It's like, a similar fashion to the cigarette industry when mm. uh, 60s, 70s, um, people started saying, oh, is, is it killing people? Yeah, is this actually killing people? And yeah, but, uh, they came out, they <clears throat> funded their own says, No, 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 everything's fine yeah. with cigarettes, you're fine. And yeah, it's kind sweet. of similar like in the in the asbestos industry. Um, yeah, definitely. The, the kind of the three main types are that most people have heard of are, are white, blue, and brown asbestos. Right. Um, white being chrysotile, brown being amosite, and blue being chrysidolite. That they're the okay. uh, proper mineral names. Um, right. And, and there's this kind of misconception still now about that. So in the industry, we treat all asbestos types as the same. They're all treated the same danger level. There's not a difference. Okay. Uh, but generally speaking, when you do speak to people, they think that brown and blue are the worst and white's kind of all right. Really? And again, like we, we believe that that came from the, the industry that was using it and the industry that was mining it. Mm. Um, and they kind of brought on a self ban originally when um, everybody started saying, oh, asbestos is bad. They kind of said, well, the, the blue's bad. I'll tell you what, we'll stop mining blue, but then brown and white's still all right to, to use. Um, and that's kind of where that misconception came from, I think. Really? Okay. They're trying to guide opinion and, you know. Yeah, they've got it. definitely, definitely. Because um, in, in this country, we, you know, we heavily used uh, cross our white asbestos. It probably makes up about 90% of all um, asbestos products contains white asbestos. So right. about that. Um, and the manufacturers um, in this country and the UK had the biggest in the world at one point, um, they only used white asbestos. So you can kind of see why they would volunteer not using the bad ones. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course. The one was not as bad, so yeah. let's still use it. Gotcha, gotcha. And well, the what, it was easily used in more materials, wasn't it? Like yeah, you could yeah, weave so it. Versatile, and, yeah, yeah. Ah, but right, you okay. Weave it and stuff, so. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Now, the first part of that question then, uh, the fact is, hey, it's natural. You know, it's, it's mm. the in the ground we can pull out, so what's the big deal? What we're worried about? What is it about it? that makes it a problem so what? it's basically when um the asbestos fiber what happens with them um that they become airborne right um, when they're disturbed the, the fibers become airborne um and the, the the fibers they split down the length so best way to describe it is like a cheese string if, if you've got kids and you've ever seen a kid's cheese string it's like you can literally keep pulling it apart pulling it apart yeah. and it's splitting like that and the, the problem with that is that each fibre, it stays the same in length, but it just uh -huh. gets thinner. And then it becomes airborne. And once it's airborne, that's when we can breathe it in. And that's the issue, is that so it, cool. it goes so small and so thin that we breathe it into our lungs. And then um, our body's own natural immune system, it can't get rid of it. Right. Uh, it, it will lodge in our lungs. The white blood cells attack around it, trying to remove it. They can't remove it. Mm -hmm. And then um, that's when the disease kicks in um, because those kind of where it's set in, that then becomes malignant. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where the issue uh, arises from. Yeah, yeah. I see. because of the, the natural um, 
chemical resistance that the uh, of course has um that's why it was used so when um you know each of those tiny fibers still have the unique properties of the original so you know when it gets into the body the body just can't break it down so sure. uh, that can lead on to various different um asbestos related diseases mm. that's fascinating though, isn't it the the very things the very properties that make it so good oh, and dear. so useful yeah. yeah becomes such a danger to our physical bodies that's quite yeah. fascinating yeah. Absolutely. So we just we cannot process it. We cannot pass it. There's there's nothing like that that our body can deal with. You know, just no. because of its characteristics. Yeah, it's believed like obviously you you exposed to asbestos fiber. So um, asbestos products only become really a, uh, an issue when they get damaged or disturbed and they release the actual fiber. Right. Uh, so asbestos products in a good condition, sealed. Mm-hmm. Uh, are okay as long as they're not disturbed it's only when you, the disturbance happens and it releases the fibre and the fibres become airborne and then humans or uh, come and, and we can breathe those fibres in is that it becomes an issue now um, breathing those fibres in the body will naturally sort of um, get rid of some but anything that gets mm-hmm. within there can then go on to to cause those diseases yeah I mean Give you an idea on on sort of figures. The uh, there's over five thousand people dying a year from asbestos related diseases. Wow. Um, is, it, is that worldwide? Is that UK? Which that's UK. Number? That's, that's UK, UK. Just UK number. Wow. And, and when you compare that, I mean, um, the, the one that I like to compare it to that makes a lot of people sit up and think is car accidents. Mm. You open the newspaper every day and you're always reading about car accidents and sure. you always read about them on the news. And there's less than half of that in car accidents. Really. Uh, yeah, about 2,000 a year, something like that, where you've got deaths from car accidents and there's over 5,000 from asbestos-related disease. That's it's, incredible. It is. It's, it's, it's crackers. And like we were speaking earlier, it's, it is kind of still a taboo subject. Yeah. And talking about it just generally in the workplace, um, when um, just day-to-day, it's kind of, it's never spoken about, never discussed. And even the press kind of follow that suit as far as I'm concerned, because it's not really ever reported on that much. Mm-hmm. No, that, that's very true. It's funny, it's a, it's a very personal interview, this for me, because uh, my, my grandfather on my dad's side, uh, that was the very reason that, that he died. Right. Uh, his whole career okay. was involved in the, the shipbuilding industry <laughs> up here yeah, in Scotland, yeah. and then it, I think there was a, a lot of property stuff as well over in the Clyde Bank areas. And eventually, uh, it was actually years and years after his death, that a kind of a, an action group around the shipbuilders uh, yeah. eventually won the case to say, no, <clears throat> it's because of this, it was because of asbestos. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, definitely like ships, you know, yeah. asbestos because they needed to try, because there was a lot of fires on boats, wasn't there? And, and exactly, uh, exactly. Uh, asbestos was used to try and sort of keep them afloat during fires, really. So, yeah, yeah. the you know, and they probably did save... That's the thing. It's, <laughs> it's a skill thing, isn't it? A lot of lives sort of yeah. Um, yeah. At, at sea and stuff like that. But obviously, it, people dying from asbestos related diseases probably far outweighs um, the actual saving of people on, on, on stuff like that. Sure. Steve, Steve McQueen, the, the, the <clears throat> actor, actor Steve McQueen, he, yeah. he died from mesothelioma, um, which is an asbestos related disease. And uh, it's kind of believed that he got it from uh, when he used to work on ships um, really yeah he used to work on ships and um in the boiler rooms and things like that so that's where it's believed that he kind of contracted his disease from as well so really, yeah. it really is so now that we've scared everybody yeah. <laughs> now, now, that we've, now that we've built up that scary a word even worse all yeah. these poor people driving their cars and panicking about their property portfolios <laughs> how can we help them now you know yeah, sorry Neil, you yeah, what I would yeah. say to that, um, I, I, I've done a lot of training for individuals and businesses um, over the years and, and, and teaching this stuff and people's reaction is, oh my God, what about this? What have I done in the past? They always think about the past and what I, I try to say to them is like, forget about the past, right. um, it's moving forward and you need to take the knowledge now to make sure that you're um, safe moving forward because mm. with asbestos, <clears throat> although um, there's, there's no sort of known level of exposure that can trigger a disease. So yeah. um, and everybody's bodies are, are probably different to, and 
you know, susceptible to different levels of um, asbestos exposure. So um, mm. all that we do know is um, the greater the exposure, the greater the risk. So sure. um, what we need to just try and reduce that risk as much as possible and induce that exposure as much as possible. Right, gotcha, gotcha. So people that are listening in, you know, these yeah. investors, managers, property organisers, portfolio owners, etc. <clears throat> What should they be thinking about when it comes to, you know, maybe looking at a new property, a new opportunity yep. that's coming up? Should they be looking for something inside the report? Should they be looking for something physically within the building? Should yep. they be thinking about it at all? Should they only be thinking about it if in their brain, this particular deal, I'm going to knock through these walls or I'm going to yep. completely demolish it or I'm going to build an extension? Where is it you can guide them when you're training people okay. like that? So... Any, any building built before the year 2000 in the UK may contain asbestos. Right. So for, if you're looking at a property um, that was built before 2000, you need to think about it. And what we always say is think about asbestos first, not last. Mm. And the reason for that is, um, especially for property and property investing, um, so say you're going to look at property, it was built, I don't know, late 70s, early 80s, it's got a real good chance of it's got asbestos in. Um, now when you're looking at the property it it can bringing it up as an issue and identifying the asbestos so if you're it should be undertaken as part of your due diligence so you'd you'd have a normal house survey complete let's talk about a house you'd have a normal house survey completed um, that might highlight issues you should always have an asbestos survey completed as well because you can then use that as a bartering tool as well so it has got its plus sides for that the property industry as such, if you, you've got a shed load of asbestos in a property and I don't know, it's old and it's knackered and you, you want to rip everything out, do it up, whatever, um, then you can use that as a bartering tool because it is going to add a lot of money onto the project for you to do that and to do it properly. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of use it on, on that circumstance. Um, and I mean, even if, even if the property is in sound condition, but there is asbestos there, it's still another thing that you can take to the seller and say, well, look, it's got all this asbestos in. Um, it might be an issue in the future. And again, you could probably barter down and use it as a bargaining tool. Guys, I guess an interesting viewpoint. That's right. Part, just part of your normal negotiation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the thing that um, some people don't quite understand is um, a normal surveying or surveyor building construction surveyor. Yeah, like a Rick, um, a Rick surveyor. A Rick surveyor. Yeah. He, yeah. He's, trained to identify or survey for asbestos of course so although, although they may comment on on visible stuff um and their, their favorites are sort of artex texture coatings on yes. stuff and garage roofs they'll comment on those things um however that that's not adequate for uh, to say it's an asbestos survey so yeah right. asbestos surveyor would need to do that yeah yeah and the reason for that um be, because when we do asbestos surveys we take small samples of materials and that's where the lab work comes in so we bring them back to the lab we analyze the samples uh through two microscopes and only when it meets certain criteria that we're looking at we then identify it as one of the one of the asbestos types right right and is there a part before that for example <clears throat> if there's a, a builder on site and he's about to you know tear down a big large outbuilding big kind of garage and stuff does he see something that thinks I should probably check if that's going to be as best? Is there a, a physical right. thing that they look at or is it not actually it's blind luck? You need to just yeah. sample everything. How, how does that work? So to give you the, so the regulations uh, based in the UK. So um, an employer um, has a duty to identify if their works are going to disturb asbestos prior to right. them starting works. Right. That goes across um, the whole industry, so whether you're working in a domestic setting or a commercial setting, um, that employer, before he sends his workers in, has to identify if there's a risk there or not. So gotcha. an electrician going to do electrical works in your house, that employer has a duty to identify whether they're going to disturb asbestos or not. Mm. Now, this is probably one of the regulations that's um, not complied with the most um, through day-to-day works. 
throughout the whole UK. Okay. Uh, especially in like the domestic especially market. Especially in the domestic more. setting. Yeah. Commercial side is uh, because that's covered as well with, under another regulation. So there's a duty to manage asbestos in non-domestic premises. So okay. if you hold a responsible for a building, you've got a duty to manage it. Um, so there's two people sort of looking at the asbestos element um, when carrying out works within commercial buildings. But on, obviously on the domestic side where you've got, you know, um, Mrs. Smith, she's not going to have an asbestos survey. She's not going to know anything. So that's where the employer, before he starts works, has that duty to, to make that assessment. So, so yeah, on that, b before any refurb work starts, the, the, a refurb survey should be carried out um, right. in line with the scope. So we were talking about taking a wall out. Well, anything that could be affected, the, the floor, the wall, the ceiling, um, needs to be tested. Plus also, is there anything in the cavity of the wall? So that's what the surveyor would do. They would inspect within the cavity of the wall because mm. in, in walls it's been used as liners, packers, all sorts of things. Yeah, and the way the, way the regulations are actually written is um, the, the employer has a duty to uh, identify if there's uh, an asbestos there or presume worst case. Yeah. So, and that's specifically how the regulations are written. So there's no sort of like, oh, I didn't know, or, oh, I'm not sure. I started works and then I found it. It's like, you've got to do that before you do anything. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so let's move that step forward then. So those samples, those tests, how does that work? What, how much needs to be taken away? How long does it take to get a result back? How much is it going to cost me as a builder, as an investor, et cetera? Yeah. Okay. What things then that you think about there? So from the sample point of view, um, gen depending on the material, because um, each different material sampled in a slightly different way, um, really? but gen it's not a massive sample, so yeah, it can be anything from sort of like a five pence piece to, you know, maybe if it's a coating, because coating's got really small sort of asbestos content, um, right. and the coating can be, you know, 20, 20 centimetres squared or something mm -hmm. like that. Is, okay. Uh, we need to get a, a good enough size sample to obviously identify if there's any asbestos in it or not. So we're not talking massive. Um, okay. So if it's a non-intrusive survey, that you know, you, you, it's minor sort of sample points that you you expect to see. Really. Right. Um, and then obviously that's taken off for analysis. Now, turnaround is really dependent on the client's needs. So you know, we we can turn a sample around in an hour um, if needed. Is that right? Uh, yeah, but generally speaking, you're looking from completing the survey on site to actually getting your report three to five days. Okay. Um, we work to as a company. And, and yeah, and, and uh, it all does depend on the laboratory company and consultancy you go to. I mean, our turnarounds is one of the best in, in the country of right. three to five days. Um, yeah. there, there's some companies out there that you'd be looking at for about four weeks. Um, <laughs> so that if, if you are looking for a survey, that's one element to definitely ask. Question. Yeah, right, yeah, of course. Right, that's good to know. This is great because it gives the listeners a feel for, okay, well, it could be managed quite quickly. So mm -hmm. if I'm speaking to someone here and they're trying to pop pan me off, you know, saying it's a three-week turnaround, then I know I'm dealing yeah. with the wrong people. Okay. Yeah. Cost-wise, is there kind of rough estimates and stuff? That, is it something that varies depending on the type of sample yeah. that you're taking? It depends on the property type. Um, generally right. speaking, yeah, so... Um, if you can imagine uh, a domestic, a small domestic house um, compared to you know a hospital, it's, the time scale is you know op complete opposite ends and yeah. complexity as well. Um, but if if we're looking at if we're talking like on a domestic sort of scale, you you're probably looking around three hundred pounds plus right. that for a server of a house. Mm -hmm. well, expecting to pay any more than that no no no, no. no yeah i mean that that kind of covers up to about a four bed house I mean, yeah if we're talking uh -huh. larger ones and things like that and like neil said the the time scale because increases because we'll need longer time on site to inspect everything more yeah. all the rest but yeah houses generally speaking 250 300 quid okay okay good stuff good stuff and god forbid we find it <laughs> you yeah. you come up, you put your big red cross on our building. <laughs> More like in. it's not that bad. So you know we found that we've got it. Maybe we're you know we're tearing down some of the walls. Maybe yeah. it's like maybe it's a commercial project. You know maybe it's a yeah. kind of commercial Terezi that we're doing. And experts like yourselves have told us, yep, it's in there. Yeah. You know, if the plan is. We, we are going to disturb it. We are going to be tearing this down. We are going to be, you know, kitting out this whole place. Right. What do we then have to do going forward? Do we have to be really careful about how we deal with things? 
the, the, the best way, I mean, um, so firstly, if it is going to be disturbed as part of the project, what we would do first is look at it and say, well, does it actually need to be disturbed? Right. So for a commercial project, I don't know, let, let's say uh, something's being rewired or rerouted with pipes mm -hmm. and the plan is to go through the bulkheads or whatever. Mm -hmm. do, do we actually need to do that or is there a workaround that can be done? Because if there's a workaround that can be done um, that's quicker and cheaper than dealing with the asbestos, that's what we would look at first. Okay. Um, because the, like Neil said uh, earlier on, if, um, if asbestos is in a good condition, Mm. Um, it's better to be left in situ and just managed in, yeah. in, in location. Um, if it is going to be removed, or if it is needed to be removed, then we would always recommend a specification is drawn up. Yeah. Um, it, it's tendered to reputable uh, contractors. We always use licensed asbestos contractors. Because um, the, the asbestos products depends on where it falls. Um, mm. Lower risk elements, such as like garage roofs, asbestos cement is considered a non-licensed product. Um, ah, they okay. High risk materials such as pipe insulation, insulating board, spray coatings, um, they're considered a licensed product because uh -huh. they've got a lot more asbestos content and um, they're a lot softer. So you could touch it and, and release a lot of asbestos quite easily. Right. Um, but the reason we always recommend a licensed contractor is because they've got everything in place anyway Mm. So if something does go wrong on a project, they've got everything in place, whereas a licensed contractor won't have that in place. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, so that's what we would do. Uh, a specification should be prepared of, of what's the end goal mm -hmm. um, for that work, and then it should be tendered to contractors. Um, yeah. And then also, what do you want to happen during the project as well? Um, if you've got other people on site or other people passes by, things like that, you, you'd want to look at, project management and full-time air monitoring of the project, right. not just the piece of paperwork at the end. Yeah. Uh, because if somebody raises that question from Joe public, how do I know I've not been exposed? Well, yes, you can say, well, I've used the right contractors and they've used this method, mm -hmm. um, but they can't really um, prove yeah. it. There's no yeah. proof. There's no evidence. Yeah. So we'd always recommend air monitoring for the projects. Um, and, also an independent person to sign off those works at the end. Um, right. So not the contractors employing their own analyst, the, the, the client should um, procure their own analyst or their own consultancy separate to the contractors. So you've got that in, independent element. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, a lot of the times people don't want to do that, especially um, like we deal with a lot of project managers um, for projects and they've got enough going on on their plate. So, <laughs> That, that again, that's where we kind of remove that asbestos headache. We will take a client all the way through from the survey, we'll spec it, we'll tender it, we'll manage the works, sign it off and provide all the documentation at the end. So right. although there is an issue there and it is a bit of a pain in the ass, it's kind of a, a, a lesser one. If, if, if yes, and it's been completely outsourced. Isn't it? Right, okay, I yeah. don't need to concern myself about that. Those guys are handling that part of the pro uh, problem yeah, for me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think something that um, Ian said about the, the, the specification, I think that really is important to get right at the front end because mm. when, you, when you ask a specialist removal contractors and you don't give them a specification and you just say, right, well, I want that removing, there's probably about five ways, you know, a million ways even to remove that material and each one has maybe a slightly different end result. Yes. So there's different right. processes how to get rid of that material okay there's and there's different outcomes and removal sometimes doesn't mean 100 percent it's gone is that right okay yeah. yeah and to give you an example so um asbestos insulation was heavily used in boiler rooms and plant rooms to insulate pipes mm -hmm. and it was really, really messy process on that original installation. So they would hand mix it on site, apply it to the pipes. And as you can imagine, that process, you know, it goes everywhere. So what, what used to happen is you get splashes on the walls, on the ceilings, on the floors, um, everywhere. And that basically is the legacy of the, of the plant room and the boiler room. So, you know, it has asbestos insulation residue dotted all over the place. And what happens over the years is people know the stuff on the pipes that gets removed, but they don't know is understand that where it wasn't intentionally put. 
Gotcha. That is a real sort of problem. And, and over the years, um, the, the boiler rooms and plant rooms get refitted with new pipes, new fuse boards and etc. So these these things are put on top of all the insulation and, and it becomes a real headache. So to 100% guarantee that all the asbestos has re- been removed from that plant room, you've got to strip everything out. So all the pipes, all the, all, the, all the fuse boxes off the walls, all the paint off the walls. So completely back down to, um, you know, nothing, bare brick, concrete floor, whatever you've got there. Um, now, if you've got a plant room and you said to a contractor, I want the asbestos removing, as you can appreciate, there's different scales to get that result. Sure, um, sure. So one contra- contractor might look, look at it and go, okay, well, I'm going to, clean all the pipes, clean all the walls, um, and that's it going to be removed. Just with hand tools? Just with hand tools. Right. Okay, what about the stuff that may be trapped underneath the pipes or underneath the fuse boxes or anything like that? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and like the the opposite end of the scale, like Neil said, everything removed off the walls, then we'd use something like a quill machine, which is like a... It's it's like a, a blasting machine which right. blasts this small garnet with um, water as well right. for, for fibre suppression, but that it's kind of like sandblasting, but not as harsh as that. Um, mm. That's kind of the, the best level of what you can go to because that, as near as damn it, will remove the asbestos. Yeah, gotcha. So, yeah, you've had one contrast is removing, but not quite everything, but everything you can see. And then one contract is completely stripping the whole thing out and it's all gone. Yeah. So, and, sure. and everything in between that. And the scale, yeah, exactly and, that. And the, <laughs> and the scale of costs will be, you know, ridiculously different of course of course Ian you touched upon you mentioned about you know the, the licensing part of the puzzle and of course you've got your expertise being in that the trade part of the, the whole world uh, that you were mentioning earlier is it a one size fits all you know is it a kind of a or oh, that guy's corgi registered for the gas is it a license license that's it or you know is it different that, levels that, that is a very good question that is a really good question so the, the health and safety executive they issue licenses to the licensed contractors Mm. now the license does give them that license to trade it does say they can do all works with asbestos Mm -hmm. however from being this side of the fence and and knowing how different contractors are and what have you some um some contractors so some small contractors can't handle large jobs some large contractors can't handle small jobs believe it or not (laughs) that they kind of that they're geared up and set up to be on site for weeks and months. And when you give them, I don't know, a, a small little project in a commercial building or small little domestic setting, it just all goes to the pot because they're not used to doing that. Of course. Um, and also with that, all the different asbestos types, um, so spray coating, it's kind of, there's still a lot about in the country, but it's few and far between um, in projects that we see really. Mm -hmm. So when you engage a contractor to to deal with spray coating, um, I mean, they're kind of the worst jobs that we deal with because the high asbestos content, essentially it's virtually 100% asbestos. It's sprayed onto beams or ceilings. So removing that in a controlled manner um, and making sure that the right project happens and we're not getting exposure and things like that, you really need a contractor that's got that experience and expertise. Whereas on the face of it, you could have two and they've both got a bit of paper saying they can do that. Yeah. In reality, only one of them can. Oh, gotcha. gotcha. Yes, very good question. Oh, excellent. That's good. Oh my goodness. We've dove into the weeds here. I'll tell you, listen, I want to be respectful of your time, but uh, you're here on a podcast this week in property. Fantastic. It's brilliant having you, but you guys, you've also got podcasts sticking along as well. Haven't you? As best as yeah. knowledge empire. Yes. That's the one. That's it. Yeah, and how are you finding that? How's that been going for you? Yeah, it's good. It's it's kind of we um we wanted to do something. Obviously, podcasting is is you know really t- taken off now, and we wanted to basically get the message out there. Um, pretty much as we've discussed today, of you know, we want people to think about asbestos um in their everyday life before they do anything. Um, thinking about asbestos first, really. That's the whole sort of yeah. mantra around. Um, the podcast itself and it's basically just giving information to property managers to help them manage their asbestos risk really mm-hmm. yeah I mean alongside that we've got a Facebook community as well um, because when, like Neil said yeah we're a business but we're not all about 
oh, we're not doing nothing unless you're paying us. It's like, <laughs> we want to share the message and get that out there. Of and the course. community goes alongside the, the podcast as well, where people can uh, join the community, um, ask us questions, get involved, have a debate, um, ask opinion, that kind of stuff. Just It's just all about trying to get it not a taboo subject anymore. Yes, that's right. Something no one even wants to look at or touch upon. Uh, that's, yeah. that's very good. He's, that's brilliant. No, listen, he's, he's have been fantastic today. I mean, some of the stuff I've learned is fantastic. Uh, and I know the listeners have got a lot from it. Uh, as usual, listeners, when, you, when it's safe to do so, remember and click through to the show note pages because we've get the, all the links to these guys the, their businesses the podcasts everything else that's there they're talking about and uh, hook in with them you know get those questions uh, asked ask them about you know getting a wee quote for a job that you need etc uh, any kind of particular problem that these experts would be able to help you absolutely brilliant yeah any advice um, yeah mm-hmm. if you find us on their Facebook community page you know you've got direct access to myself and Ian um, yeah just go on there if you've got any queries you have to look at anything happy to answer any questions tremendous yep. but most importantly do that before Ian gets bored again and goes to another <laughs> job yeah exactly <laughs> won't be around for long <laughs> <laughs> no listen Neil Ian honestly can't thank you enough it's been absolutely fantastic thank you for your time today no least thank, thank you us. cheers Hi folks, it's Richard here again. I really hope that you enjoyed today's show. Now listen, I've got two links to help support you on your property journey. And I want you to write these down when it's safe to do so. You might be driving in your car just now listening to the podcast, and that's fine. But please make sure that you get back to this and write down these links. Okay, are you ready? Got your pen in hand? So the first one, thisweekinproperty.com. Now that's the website for this podcast. On there, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so that you don't miss out. What you can also do on there is catch up on tons and tons of past episodes. There are hours and hours of property related content and some amazing guests with some fantastic insights to help you on your property journey. So that is this week in property.com. Okay, next link. Property protege.com and let me spell that one out for you p-r-o-p-e-r-t-y p-r-o-t-e-g-e that's propertyprotege.com now what's it all about well the property protege intensive is designed to give you the lift that you need into the world of property and if you've already started if you've already got some experience then this can help you accelerate your progress even further. The experiences that people have had at Protégé and the success that they've achieved afterwards has been life-changing for many people. So go there right now if you're serious about property and if you want to build a highly successful property business. That's propertyprotégé.com So there you go. That's two links to some fantastic resources that are going to help you. And listen, talking about help, can you help me to help other people? You see, the more that we can share this podcast, then more people can learn from the fantastic guests that I've been so lucky to talk to. How can you help? Well, it's very simple and very quick. Just a short review on iTunes is going to help make that happen. If you go to thisweekinproperty.com forward slash iTunes, that will guide you to the very place that you will be able to help other people. So thank you. Thanks for doing that. And thanks for listening into the show. And I look forward to bringing another great guest to you in the next show.